Brazil and the United States are, are facing some of the same global challenges right now. So it's essential for us to be in dialogue about this, I think. I want to emphasize, I, I understand there are contextual differences between the United States and Brazil, just like there are contextual differences inside of each country. And, and we are all experiencing a global wave of reaction that we have to like confront together. Right? So I'm going to talk in, in some detail about what anarchists in the United States did, especially at the beginning of Trump's presidency. And uh, hopefully this will be interesting. At the end, we, we can have a big open discussion. Okay, so the, the story begins when Obama was the president. And in fact, uh, we were seeing pretty much all of the same forms of oppression under Obama that we see under Trump. Uh, millions of people were in prison. Uh, millions of people were deported. Uh, environmental destruction, attacks on indigenous rights, and uh, everyone struggling economically. When Trump and Clinton were running against each other, we were actually afraid that Clinton would win because we have a theory that today the state is like a hot potato, that whoever holds control of the state will lose legitimacy in the public eye because the state is no longer able to solve the problems that capitalism creates for people. And so whoever can present themselves as like a, a rebel opposing the status quo will gain popularity. And if, uh, if Clinton had been elected, the far right would have had four more years to be able to present themselves as rebels. Really, with Trump's election, I, I think that we were punished, we anarchists were punished for not succeeding in organizing a successful defense against neoliberalism. But our hope when Trump was elected was that the far right had come to power in the United States too early when they weren't popular enough to hold on to it. And we had uh, debates about what Trump represented. Definitely Trump, Trump's victory, like Bolsonaro's victory, represented the polarization of society. When, when people tried to show that Trump is bad because he's a misogynist or something, uh, this is a total misunderstanding of our political moment. People are voting for Trump because he's a misogynist, because he's a racist, because he's a liar and he's corrupt and all these things. They like that about him. So this, this like liberal idea or, you know, or left idea that would educate people about how bad he is is a total mistake. It just makes him stronger. As anarchists, we think the only thing that we could do effectively is to show the ways that he is weak, not the ways that he is bad. Trump was elected promising the white working class that factories would come back to the United States. And this seemed like a, like a return to the fascism of the early 20th century. Like uh, the wealthy capitalists would create some kind of bargain with the white working class to, to make their lives better. But in fact, in the 21st century, uh, in a neoliberal globalized economy, it's, it's not possible to bring factories back to people in the United, you know, and give jobs to people in the US. It will only be robots working in the factories. And I think actually everybody understood this. Everyone understood that Trump was lying, including his supporters. Actually what Trump was offering is something different. Not to change the distribution of resources for the benefit of the white working class, but instead to change the distribution of violence. In a, a context like a post-industrial complex where more and more people are part of the surplus population that is unnecessary to capitalism, that the only way that the system is maintained now is by increasing violence. And Trump was actually offering to change the way this violence is distributed. He's saying, okay, white workers, you, you won't get a job in a factory, you'll continue to be poor, but we'll, we'll turn the police mostly against the immigrants, against the black people, against the queer people. And so although we think that Trump still represents neoliberalism, uh, he represents a new nationalist strategy for managing neoliberalism. And so we actually thought this was a change from what was happening before, that it's not just the continuation of neoliberalism, but neoliberalism getting even worse. And that it was necessary to respond to this, not because we think that one kind of neoliberalism is good and one kind is bad, but because responding to the particular details of our situation is how we work to overthrow capitalism as a whole. The election of Trump was a surprise to everyone and it put us in a bad situation because anarchists were not very organized at the end of the Obama era. We didn't have strong networks and now the, the far right controlled the entire government and at the same time they could say that they were rebels, that they were rebels against the status quo. They had all the power and they had the position of looking like rebels. And nobody else was prepared for this. Nobody else had a plan to do anything. And so, so we were alone facing the entirety of the state and the, and the far right, which was a, a good situation, actually. I'll explain why. 
Usually when we are fighting against the state and the left or the, you know, the liberals are also trying to argue against the authorities, uh, they are able to confuse most people and make people think that they can change the world just by holding a sign or by voting, which is actually just bullshit. You know? and, and so th this was a good situation in which finally everyone was confused except us. We were like, all right, attack. You know? uh, progressive leftists were confused by Trump's election for two reasons. First, they have this progress narrative in which things are just getting better all the time. And if you can just obey the law and like, like things on Facebook, like eventually <laughs> there'll be no more patriarchy. And the election of Trump showed that we haven't really made any progress since slavery, since segregation, uh, which is shocking for them. And it, it was also confusing for them because after Obama was president for eight years, they were in the habit of identifying with the state thinking of the state as representing the best parts of humanity. When Obama was president, you could look at Obama and you could say, he's like, he's like my cool uncle, you know? <laughs> but when you have this like Nazi clown as your president, it becomes very hard to identify with the state. We knew that there was a moment in which everyone was shocked by this new, new situation, but that this moment would not last very long. It's, it's very easy for people to get used to things, right? And once you get used to any, something, the only thing that, that is unbearable, so it was, a, it was a dangerous situation for us to take action. The police had been waiting to get revenge on anarchists and, and even more on, on black people since the Black Lives Matter riots. But we believe that it would be even more dangerous for us not to take action immediately because it would give the state more time to, to intensify repression, to get organized. We had to show immediately that, that it wouldn't be possible to have business as usual with Trump as president. We believe that it would be more dangerous not to act because the repression, it would, first it would go to immigrants, black people, but also it would come to us. And if we didn't do something, it would, we would be in a worse situation when it reached us. The first action the anarchists called for was on the day that Trump would become president, that we would be there to, to make a big disruption. 28,000 police were mobilized in Washington, D.C. to control the area. And the media were reporting that one million bikers for Trump would be in Washington, D.C. And the, the bikers said that they would build a wall of meat to protect the president. We were afraid that, uh, that when we went there that, that there would be fascists going around the streets. They were on the internet saying that they would shoot us. And in fact, there were a lot of arguments among anarchists about whether it was a good idea to go there or not. Many anarchists did not go there. On the, on the day of Trump's inauguration, in fact, the interesting thing was that the fascists were not very organized in the streets. There, there were not like big groups of fascists in Washington, D.C. Maybe this is just because there were so many police there that the fascists were in uniform. People made blockades around the par parade route to make it hard to, for Trump supporters to go in. And uh, in fact, the police did not really attack these blockades because they were mostly worried about the Black Bloc that had also been called. There were about 500 people who came to the Black Bloc. So 500 anarchists against 28,000 police. So I, I think they only outnumbered us 56 to 1. Which, yeah, this would have been fine. But, uh, but also the people who were supposed to do communications for the march did not come. So it was a bunch of lost anarchists surrounded by 28,000 police. Despite this, uh, bravely, people managed to, to go 13 blocks before the police stopped us. And the police finally surrounded the march. Um, there's this beautiful moment where uh, the, the police have surrounded and trapped the march, but they haven't, they haven't been able to start arresting people yet. And uh, somebody in the black block has an umbrella, and they open the umbrella, and everyone counts down from 10 to 1. And they charge the line of like armored riot police. And the, the police are, are shooting their chemical weapons, and the chemical weapons are just bouncing off the umbrella. So maybe 200 people broke through the police lines like this and escaped. The other people, about 250 people, were captured and arrested and charged with enough crimes to spend, for each of them to spend 80 years in prison. This was the, the first day of the Trump presidency and the idea was to intimidate people out of taking action. But it, th this is not the end of what happened that day. The police were so busy uh, after this arranging the arrests of all of these people and keeping up with the blockades around the parade and dealing with the smaller black blocks that continued to act that they, they shifted from being able to control all of the city to only controlling a few small areas. And as a result of this, uh, large areas opened up that were actually controlled by the protesters. 
If you've seen the, uh, the pictures of the limousine burning, the, the black box smashed the limousine when we went by it the first time. But people set it on fire many hours later when the police had lost control of the town. Has someone here seen the video of Richard Spencer being punched? You've seen it a hundred times? No? <laughs> this happened after the police had given up control of, of part of the city. Richard Spencer represents the fascist and Nazi movement in the United States. And he had come to Washington, D.C. to publicly accept power, at, thanks to Trump, on behalf of the fascist movement. And so for him to try to do this and then be, be punched in the middle of doing it was a very important symbol for everyone in the United States. Because it, it showed that it would not be possible for fascists and the far right to control the streets under Trump. I think that hitting fascists is a, is a good thing, but it's, it's really important to understand that the meaning of this was not that a fascist was punched, but rather that punching fascists was connected to resistance to the state. And that this uh, changed the public imagination about what it looks like to resist. But still, we're only talking about a few thousand people taking action in this situation. The next day, hundreds of thousands of people filled the streets for the women's marches. And it was inspiring to see so many people, but, but people didn't arrive with a, a plan for how to destabilize the Trump regime. So the, the question for us is, how to, is always how to connect uh, the, the small number of people who want to take militant direct action with the large number of people who want to do something. But the important thing was that this day, the first day of, of Trump's presidency, shaped the public imagination, gave people the feeling that it would be possible to resist. So a few days later, Trump announced the, the Muslim ban, that people from seven mostly Muslim countries would be prohibited from coming to the United States, even if they had papers. In the small town that I live in, uh, Again, we knew that we had to do something immediately. We heard that there were protests at some other airports. So we went to the airport in our town. We brought up a sign, you know. But we also brought a big banner in case there were 10 of us there instead of two of us. Uh, when we got there, actually, there were 4,000 people there who were all surprised to see each other. But nobody else had a banner. And most people had never been to a demonstration before. So 4,000 people were next to the airport, but not in front of it, with like 10 police just forming a little line. All we had to do was, was put out the banner and, and start marching, and, and all of us went in front of the airport and shut the airport down. And this was happening all around the United States. Uh, so many airports were, were shut down that day. And this is, this is important because it, it threatened the functioning of the economy also. And it, it showed that it would not be possible to have business as usual with Trump as the president, which had the effect of dividing the ruling class it was only after this that we saw judges say that Trump's uh, Muslim ban was unconstitutional, was not legal. And after this, the, the newspapers started to talk about Trump like he was uh, not like a successful president. And uh, employees inside of the White House started to leak information. This is very important because it created instability inside of the Trump administration. I, in my experience in social movements, they usually peak really early before you expect it. And I think this was the, the peak for us, actually, the first week that Trump was president. Of course, we didn't know it was the peak. We, we didn't even know we were in a movement yet. We were still waiting to get killed. You know? In retrospect, like looking back, if there was a time when we could have done more, that was the time right then. Now I will introduce another bad fascist person. This person, uh, Milo Yiannopoulos. Um, the, Trump succeeded uh, at a moment when the far right was trying to come up with a, a new idea of, of who could constitute the far right support base. They, they wanted to figure out ways to use identity politics to divide the groups that had been against the right. So Milo was a person who is a gay man, and he would use his gay identity to say that he was afraid of Muslims. He, he called Trump daddy, and he would say that he wanted daddy Trump to protect him, which is like a really like smart idea, right? To, to take everything in identity politics that was like liberal rather than radical or anarchist and, and use it to try to legitimize the state.